Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Max. And this is Movies Actually, where we give you an honest review of the movies we've meddled with so mischievously over at Baby Movies. And on this episode, we will be talking about the one and only Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> this is the 1986 John Carpenter directed, I believe that Cineflex described it as a suspense action sci-fi kung fu ghost story. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, okay, there. I, I, I'll agree with that. Starring Kurt Russell, Dennis Dunn, Kim Cattrall, James Hong, Victor Wong, and an honourable mention for that most 80s of, of mooks, uh, Al Leung as well. <laughs> so, so many movies he's in. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, this is... Well, we've kind of gone from Carpenter's most kind of political film to his most just out there fantasy romp I, I don't know yeah. I would call it frivolous frivolous I would, yes. I would call it frivolous it's like one of those films you go what, why does this exist well, <laughs> you know well, well, unlike the last one we can't really sort of go into what was the subtext of the film because it is just pure entertainment well the the movie exists because John Carpenter loves Hong Kong cinema mm, it's pretty much that simple I remember when we did this on the show uh, you remember you saying it would be an original. The original screenplay was written as a, a, as a western, mm. and then there's a guy called it something. It's a W. D. Richter, I think his name is. He's the guy who came and did the final adaptation. Oh, okay. He's also the guy who apparently. Oh, he did. I was having a look earlier. He, there's a number of other films that I recognise that he did. One of them being his directorial debut, which was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. Evil. From the eighth dimension. Oh, okay, so he was out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, okay. Uh, oh, yes. that's it. Yeah, he apparently he did the, the final screenplay for Slither. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, right, yeah, that has explained a lot. Um, but he kind of more felt that it helps suspension of disbelief if you kind of limit the amount of insane that you're asking people to believe. And that's why it got moved from a Wild West setting to a contemporary setting. Okay, okay. Which is a Considering shame. what you're being asked to believe in the final product, that's saying something. It is a bit, it is a bit, yeah. But although, personally, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I have a, a wide berth when it comes to, or wide dearth, should I say, when it comes to suspension of disbelief, so I'd have been quite happy, I could have quite happily gone along with it as a Western. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, I'm on the same angle entirely. But the simple premise of this movie is not simple no <laughs> no not at all it's just not <laughs> but before we get into those sorts of details let's mm. talk about how did you find this uh, so i was definitely still living in windham um since before i moved to france so it would have been i think around 89 okay so i would have been about 14 15 and it was one of the ones that we hired from from the shop again it's probably i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm pretty sure it was one of those ones where i think i think i've mentioned on these before uh, we were of that age because my brother's three years older than me that we could be left on our own. So my mum and dad used to go uh, on sort of like short breaks or whatever. Oh, right. And they'd leave us alone for the weekend. And it was one of the ones we went down to the video shop and grabbed it. And I must admit, when I first watched it, I wasn't that impressed. Oh! What, what, what? I mean, right. Yeah, even though at the time I had no real sort of pretensions to being like a writer like I am now. Mm. And I hadn't really kind of made a study of anything like... Um, or like screenplay, uh, I had to write screenplay or anything like that. But some of the massive expo dumps in the film, I found, kind of took me out of it. And so I was just, I kind of was a, maybe a bit snobbish at the time, I don't know, but was quite dismissive of it. It was like, oh, it was okay. Okay. Plus at the time, I must admit, I wasn't, I, I didn't really know who Carpenter was. I hadn't sort of delved that. I was still earning my Even horror at chops that point, all the time. You didn't know who Carpenter was. No, I, I, oh, I didn't. Right. If you, uh, certainly when I was younger, most of the time, as I was only concerned with who was on screen, not was who was doing stuff behind the camera. Oh right, you see, I was very much the other way around. I mean, I I knew who was starring. I always knew who was starring, but I cared about who had made the movie. So I suppose that's the difference between us. Absolutely, yeah. This is a really strong memory for me. This is June the 27th, 1987. We had just moved council houses from one estate to another. 
Uh, literally that very day, it was later in the afternoon, the house was mostly full of large cardboard boxes full of crap and a few pieces of furniture. And us kids had run out of energy for the day. And instead of having us tangle their feet and get under in, in, in their way, they sent us to the video store to go and hire something. And this is what we hired. So I have a very distinct memory of sitting in what is still my mum's living room, three or four in the afternoon, on a three-person seater uh, city, just surrounded by boxes with a television set set up in front of the fireplace just to keep us out of their way and let them go on with moving. <laughs> well, it's certainly going to keep your attention, definitely. It did. It did. It caught our attention and we loved it. We really did love it. When we hired it, I didn't know it was John Carpenter. But um, just brilliant. It's endlessly engaging. I mean, what, what was I? I was at 87, so I was... Yeah, I was just barely 13 and a half when this came out, uh, at least on video release in the UK. And I loved everything about it. I think this was even before I discovered Hong Kong cinema. So I didn't even know how good it could be in every other respect. I definitely discovered Hong Kong cinema before this because some friends of uh, my dad's, they used to run a pub, um, just unfortunately not there anymore, um, The Bell in, in Wyndham. And we used to go around there and while well, dad was downstairs having a drink, we'd be upstairs with the, the landlord's um, two sons watching Jackie Chan movies. <laughs> oh, right. See, I don't think I was probably introduced to Hong Kong cinema until after we'd moved into the house. Ah, uh, okay. So for me, this was kind of my first experience of a Hong Kong cinema experience. And I loved it. It was wild. It was, um, if you'll excuse the expression, bolts to the wall. It, it committed completely Absolutely. to every aspect of its premise. And I loved it for it. Oh, this underworld of of America where monsters and the black blood of the universe and things like that could exist tickled the hell out of me I loved it yeah. loved it straight away it as I said it needed to grow on me I had to sort of go away and then revisit it a few years later and then it was like ah now I get it now mm, you see yeah. for me it was always a mystery that it was once again, like the thing, one of Carpenter's failures, famous failures. Yeah, it did yeah. not do well in the box office. And I, no, it was like it was about twenty million to make. Uh huh. It was about nineteen twenty million, and worldwide, it only took about one eleven million one hundred something. Worldwide. I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. And apparently, world of that. Only about five hundred and seventy-seven dollars was worldwide. Most of it was in states. Oh, crap, chief! <laughs> it didn't get much of a chance, unfortunately. Which no, is a shame. It did not. Which is no. a shame. Uh, but this was like on uh, um, the first of. I mean, one of, one of the periods when when Carpenter was at his most prolific. Because I mean, he did this in eighty-six. Prince of Darkness the following year. Of course. And then yet they lived the year after that. Of course, yes. And it's weird because when I was looking it up, um, so obviously in this. As I said, you've got um, Victor Wong as Egg Chen, mm. Dennis Dunn, who reunite in 87 for Prince of Darkness. Yes, of course. Carpenter. But also he's got um, James Hong in this as well. Now, also in the same year, so in the same year as this, 86, um, Victor Wong was also in The Golden Child. Oh, right, okay. You're breaking my heart, ass wife. Yes. But also... Um, of course he was, yes. James Hong, obviously in this as, as Lo Pan. Yeah. He's also in The Golden Child. He plays in Maracas too. And in the same year, he did Shanghai Surprise as well. Shanghai Surprise? I don't think I've seen that one. I have. I don't remember much about it, but I, th I think I have seen it. Yes, yeah, so, very briefly, from what, what, what we can tell you of the plot, it's kind of weird because your central character is actually technically the sidekick. I know there's this argument that goes, I, know, I think I'm on the opposite side of you. I, always, I, I, I like it. I think it explains it a bit better. I think I can... I understand what you're saying, but I also think you're getting ahead of yourself. Let's talk about the plot. It's your turn. I did it last time. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I was just introducing uh, it. So this is the story of one Jack Burton, a uh, truck driver transporting livestock cross-country who arrives in San Francisco, enjoys a uh, plentiful evening of gambling and entertainment with his friends. And then at the end of the night, when it comes time to settle up, it turns out one of his friends can't quite cover the bed yet and asks him to accompany him on a trip to pick up his girlfriend before the debt is paid. Whereupon, 
shenanigans and adventure ensue. All of the adventure. All of the adventure. Yeah. He models Jack Burton on, on John Wayne. Do you know what? That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> that does make sense. I wouldn't have seen it naturally, but now you say it to me, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. There's another one that apparently he wasn't too sure. He was a bit worried. I think Kurt Russell was a bit worried that the film wasn't going to do well because it was... The, the ideas and the themes in it were so niche. But he was just so happy again to, to get the chance to work with Carpenter again. Uh, he even turned down the lead in Highlander. Oh, you're kidding me. No, apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I mean, that's so weird to hear. But I'm glad he didn't. Yeah. I'm glad he didn't. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because he just makes this film. It's that constant just not knowing what the hell is going on <laughs> all right what's going on wang why'd they steal your girl i've lost out you could probably do almost almost do a drinking game for the amount of times that jack burton says can somebody tell me what's going on or some variation of that jack burton is the quintessential absolutely definition of the everyman he's just a man doing his job trying to make some money mm-hmm he wins a bit of cash, tries to collect on it, and things happen that just drag him deeper and deeper down a hole he never knew existed. Yeah. It's it's a shame. I would, I would have loved it if this had done better, if they'd done another one. Like a completely different story, but with Jack Burton. I would it, have it, loved another Jack Burton story. Yeah, yeah. It, it did feel like it was being set up for it. Yeah, so I, mean, so I had a look. Well, obviously, special features are fantastic. If you, get, if you do get... Try and, I'm sure there's a Blu-ray one, but try and get this one as well. There's some really nice stuff. There's even a transcript, a proper transcript of the article from Cineflex uh, about like all the like the production side of it. So like interviews with um, Robert Edlund, who did the special effects, how they did all of that stuff. And it's weird because I had that copy because oh. I have the front cover from the magazine, mm-hmm. and I remember I had it. I fortunately I don't think I have it anymore. I think it was at my mum's when there were some french assholes decided to set fire to the basement at my mum's apartment and destroyed loads of stuff that were in, stored in the basements yeah well that that, that is unfortunate yeah that did really yeah. yeah so obviously this was um what the third third film i think for kim cattrall because she'd done porkies didn't we say mm-hmm. and um Police Academy before this. Of course, yes, which was 84, 85, wasn't yes, it? Yes, 84, I think it was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we were talking about Porky's earlier, weren't we? Oh! Turn up! <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, um, sorry, just to clarify, sorry. guys, when I was a young lad, I had a thing. For Kim Cattrall, I'll be honest, I still do. Well, yeah, yeah. Apparently, when she was when they were filming this, she had to leave every day at four thirty because she was also appearing in Chekhov's Three the Three Sisters on stage <laughs> every night as well. Well, good for her that she was keeping herself busy all the time. Yeah, yeah. As I said, I I struggled with it initially, but came to love it for you know for the wonderful film that it is that just meshes so many different genres together so seamlessly and i mean even you know you could see in in parts of the film where where it was still trying to feature figure into those kind of western roots that it originally had like the guy with the bandolier and things like that all right yes so there are still those western elements in it because i mean hasn't carpenter said that's what he loves that's one of his favorites wasn't it his westerns is one of his favourite genres. He's always wanted to. I, I, I know he's fond of the western genre. I don't know if it's his favourite. Uh, what was it? I did see as well, both Kurt Russell and John Carpenter initially wanted Jackie Chan for the part of... Wong. What, uh, what was it? Wong or Wang? Wang, sorry. Wang. Yeah. The studio weren't too sure because apparently he'd only done a couple of English-speaking films and they didn't think his command of English was good enough. <laughs> Uh, and they, but they, they still approached him and he turned it down. Yes, because to him it would have been an insulting role. I don't know. Do you think? I mean, when you look at the likes of, um, uh, was it Shanghai Nights? Isn't it? Was the first? Yes, one? but that was fifteen years later or ten years later. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suppose he was still at his height in, in Hong Kong at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it would it would have been a step down for him mm. to make that performance because because Wang. 
doesn't do very much until the final act. You know, he talks and he runs and he does things, but he doesn't actually do martial arts the, uh, you know. until the final fight. Oh, I don't know. There's the, there's the um, there's a couple of bits. There's the, obviously the, the famous bit where Jack leaps out and he's already taken everybody out. That's an act two. All right. Yep. All right. <laughs> I, I just I just no, I mean that I, I think Jackie Chan would have gone. This is below me. That this is I could. Yeah, this I, is below my skill level. Yeah. True. True. Yeah. Fair enough. I could see that. That's the way I would have assumed he was taking it. It's like I can do so much better than this. Mm. Why do you want me? It's a waste of my time. Yeah, that would make sense. But, yes, please do check this one out if you've never seen it. It's pretty family-friendly. I mean, I know, it's, I know it does get a 15 rating, but by today's standards, there's... I wouldn't say there's anything there's in there. There's little to shock the children. Yeah. And so, yeah, just, you know, grab yourself a load of popcorn, switch off your brain, and just have a wonderful time with this fantastic piece of 80s nostalgia. It's- a lovely little piece of modern Western fantasy. Yes. Yeah, it's it's an attempt to take an, an older style of storytelling and bring it into the modern era. I won't say it does it excellently, because having watched many, many more Hong Kong and Chinese and Japan, Japanese-oriented films since then, I realised how much better it could have been. But for what it is, it's an enjoyable fantasy romp and you will have a lot of fun there are a lot of jokes and there are lots of things for you to laugh at both in the good and the bad sense Mm -hmm. definitely so yeah i mean i'm gonna give it i am giving it um i'm gonna give it a one and a half you're gonna give it one and a half i'm gonna give it a one and a half because again even i even as much as i have come to love it as i said just sometimes those big pieces of exposition just drag it down that little bit for me but that's Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. All right, so I'm going to give one for the movie. It's brilliant and it stands the test of time. But I'm also going to give another thumb for nostalgia. Um, if you are young and experiencing things in the, for the first time, you will have so much more fun with this. It's worth showing your kids for a first martial arts movie or something like that. So I'll give a tentative second, but mostly the one. Because it's great and it's worth your time. Yeah, and I, I, I suppose on that point, again, if you're talking about, if you're obviously a younger member of our audience watching this, that's the thing to remember this. Everything that is done is done in good faith. So don't come away from it thinking that it's about cultural appropriation or anything like that. It's not. It's a celebration of the cultural differences that exist between yeah, us. Yeah, it's the director trying to tell a story around the things that he loves himself. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, oh, oh, God. Oh, God. Sam. We gotta go. We gotta go. Look, look. What? Zulus! Thousands of 